You ready? You're listening to The Real Pineapple Podcast Network. Humble host Hunter here. Hope you're all having a great start to uh, what's this month? March. Oh my God, what is time anymore? Um, <laughs> I hope you're all having a great one so far. Um, I'm horribly excited to have two guests uh, on the show today. Um, I've got uh, actress, writer, uh, producer. Oh my God, what doesn't she do? Uh, in uh, Jennifer Levinson, and then I have um, director. And I'm going to butcher your name. I'm going to try so hard not to. So feel free to yell at me. Uh, Almog Avedon uh, Atonir. Did I get that? Nailed it. Oh, there we go. 10 out of 10. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me. How are you guys doing today? Thanks for having us. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're both very excited. Thanks. Uh, thanks for doing this. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much for making the time. So, um, uh, Jennifer, I'm going to start with you because we're talking about your guys' movie uh, Trust today. So in doing a little research, I did see that it was originally a short that you did a couple years ago. So my first question out the box to you is going to be, why take this short and then go ahead and make it into a feature film? What was the process on, uh, process like on that? And like, what was the decision making behind it? Yeah, so when I initially wrote the short, in the back of my mind, I knew I wanted to make it into a feature. Um, it's obviously hard to execute on that, but uh, that was my intention. It's a proof of concept. I knew I wanted to tell a longer form story about the trials and tribulations of dealing with a loss in a realistic way. Um, and I wanted to uh, leave a message that I have Braved in other movies that sort of told similar stories. So um, I made the short with the team that was very different from the feature. And I learned a lot on making the short. Um, got very lucky that it got into Tribeca as part of the now creators market. And that started sort of opening up other doors for me to develop it further. And um, I, I had a rough feature script that was in the works and Almog and I were at a bar one day and he made a joke to me about directing the feature, throwing his hat in the ring when I was telling him about some of the issues on the short that I experienced. And the next day I sent him the script and was like, cool, you're in, let's do this thing. So <laughs> I've sort of used the proof of concept and some of the laurels that we got to basically ask everyone I've ever met in my life for money to make the feature. <laughs> Until I got enough equity investors and put in some of my own money and was able to green light the feature. Now, okay, so uh, I, I want to double back to something you just said. What what sort of issues were you having on the short? Um, I think some just creative differences with certain people on the team um, and certain ways that I I personally thought that characters should be. I realized in a short, things I think are more um, contained. So you sort of have to be a little more on the nose with who these characters are. But I think uh, they were missing some of the nuances that I would have wanted in a longer form version. So Almog and I, Almog really helped me develop each character a little bit more. Like my character, for example, in the short was a little more um, grungy and like down on her life. But I wanted the feature to show that she was doing just fine until her mother died. And that's sort of what uh, transitions her into a darker headspace. So um, sort of creative differences with my own self and with certain people on the team. I knew um, it was important for me to trust the director I worked with and Almog and I uh, worked on the developing the script at nauseum to a point where once we were on set, I knew I could just wipe my hands and let him do his job and not feel like I was a backseat director. So that was really important to me too. Now, was that something on the short that you didn't feel was the case? Did you feel that kind of that like uncertainty of like, is everyone, is this going to come together the way I want? Like, I think so. And obviously on a short, you are tighter on the budget and 
um, on a feature, we had more room to sort of develop things. So um, I, I think I, I was also finding my own voice as a creative producer um, and maybe on the short where I didn't feel um, as strong in my own self to be able to stand up for certain choices I wanted. On the feature, I was very clear about things that I absolutely felt were necessary to keep in and things that I was comfortable relinquishing control over. So um, I think it was more about me discovering um, how actively involved I was comfortable being and how to execute some control in a healthy way. Fair. I, I as as someone who likes to control everything, I I feel that to my core. <laughs> so 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 I I sympathize, but. Props to you for being able to do that. Um, Almog, I'm going to throw it to you here real quick, sir. So I was doing, uh, in doing a little research, um, I went ahead and I discovered Almost Cool. And I went ahead and I watched <laughs> uh, like uh, seven or eight of the shorts. Um, the ones I definitely ended up binging were uh, were Wiener vs. Brain, which... Uh, <laughs> Um, the, uh, the, the Snapchat episode in particular, I thought was, uh, incredibly hilarious. Um, thank I, you. Thank you. I did notice though, that, um, you did a couple of shorts during lockdown as well. And, um, I, um, I, I guess I'll ask both of you about this. I'll start with you all, Mark. I know for myself, um, just dealing with the emotional and like mental toll of COVID and lockdown and everything, it was hard to find myself, um, kind of hard to get in that headspace to create but the stuff that I was creating I found was some of my best stuff once I can you know had the distance to could look back on it kind of talk to me about the process of running uh you know doing almost cool through lockdown and kind of what you discovered about yourself as an artist um that is a very interesting question and um and I'm glad you got to binge some of the almost cool stuff <laughs> but um it was definitely you know by by that point we had kind of we had we had created less frequently on the channel um but when it was locked down i think everyone was in uh in creative deficit and just wanted to make stuff and me and like three of my three of my really good friends you know uh, that together we started the channel like way back in the day in college we we'd all been, been like wanting to do something and then because it's you know not not safe to be out and you know have a whole big crew we we're like what what do we make especially for those concepts that have the relatability factor what do we do now that's relatable so now that everyone's locked down what do we do that everyone you know a lot of people can relate to but then also we can make safely so it's literally just the four of us so um before you know, we would have us, we would have a full on crew, like we would have a sound person, a camera person. And here it was like the only way to do it is if it's literally just the four of us. And so if we're not going to have a director of photography, it's me filming. And that was part of it was me kind of getting back to the, the roots, the more of the DIY, you know, for YouTube, which that's kind of how we did, you know, back at Chapman back in college. Um, so this was like kind of, kind of coming back to that, which was really, um, creatively liberating, you know, it's the, like being confined, um, it was actually allowed us to be more creative in that way. So it was, it, it was really just fun to get back into filming stuff. I know all of us wanted to just make something. For you creatively coming out of lockdown, what was the biggest, le uh, what was your biggest like lesson takeaway? coming out of lockdown um you know i think it's to if you want to do something there's always a way to make it happen even even trust you know it was post like the the heyday of lockdown yeah. but it was still like during the pandemic like like shoots were just starting to come back like productions were just kind of starting to pick back up and you know jen and i had many conversations about like you know, well, not many conversations, one conversation about like, <laughs> do we wait until the pandemic is over? And then we were like, well, who knows how long, it, you know, it's probably here to stay for a while. So yeah. let's not wait. Let's just, yes, it will cost more in the sense that some more budget than we would like goes towards 
testing and the protocols, you know, to meet like CDC guidelines and all that stuff. But it's like, if we wait, we might never make this movie. And if we want to make it badly enough, which we did, we're like, we'll figure out a way to make it happen. So I think the biggest lesson is like, if there's a will, there's a way, um, you know, you don't, don't wait for it. Just kind of figure out how to make it happen. Love that. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to ask you the same question and then I'm going to add a little bit there. Um, what was the big, so what was the biggest lesson you had coming out of lockdown, but also what's the biggest script change that happened like during lockdown, uh, between trust, as far as getting it to where it was to where it is now? Great question. Um, I would say, so we shot in my parents' house and <laughs> my dad is a former doctor who retired at, you know, at the start of COVID and my parents were neurotic. Like when I would visit them, I would stand in their backyard on an opposite side of the pool and my dad would be on the other side of the pool and he's losing his hearing. And I, I would be like, why am I here? I can't even like, we can't even speak right now because we're on the opposite end of the pool. This is pointless. <laughs> Um, so the first time that I actually hugged my parents from the start of COVID um, was the day that we came to load into their house and we'd all been tested and um, they were leaving to give us the opportunity to shoot in their house. So that was kind of an interesting, like after, I don't know, nine months of not being anywhere near them to be like, hi, good to see you by we're shooting in your house was, <laughs> was interesting. Um, I would say like, the the biggest script changes would be um i think there were more characters like more side characters obviously there are a lot of like family members and people coming and going there's a funeral scene and i had to limit some characters knowing that every single character every single actor we bring in needs to be tested um needs to there's a risk of them giving somebody covid there there is a zone system that we had where um in my mind, I'm thinking the actors are zone A, then we have crew people who are zone B, and then technically anyone we come into contact with or live with is zone C. So if I have some side character who lives with a roommate, now we have many more additional people of exposure. Mm. So I had to consider those changes in the script. Um, and fortunately, knock on wood, nobody got COVID during the shoot. But um I would say that that was the 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 biggest change, um, and which wasn't too too major. Um, but we were changing the script, little tweaks here and there, up until like the day of shooting. As long as scenes were in place, um, words were being changed day of. Okay. Um, follow up, uh, following up on that, um, you said that uh, you felt like Alma, you like you felt comfortable, like from jump, like this is our director, he's got this, I know I can relinqu relinquish control. Is it harder to go ahead and kind of creatively push back with someone that you're such friends with, like as far as criticism, or does that make it easier? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you first. Jennifer. Yeah, I honestly think it was easier. I, I don't want to be too precious with anything I make. I had like one thing that I said had to stay in the script or not be in the script, which is a love story. Um, I had some... Re script readers tell me to add a love story and I was like but this is not that I don't want a love story in here that was the one thing I was married to but um in terms of bringing Almog on I think from the get-go we had a lot of conversations about um even costumes I remember I had a certain vision Almog had a different vision and I was like you know what I'm gonna trust you we'll go with that <laughs> um but it didn't feel like there were ever any moments of like me having to butt heads or really defend myself it was like um easy to communicate. I think at the end of the day, um, it depends on all creative parties having their, uh, having flexibility. Like obviously we're each going to have a couple things that we're like gung ho about and passionate about. But, um, I was, uh, I've seen all Mog's work. I've worked with him on shorter projects in the past. And so I, in bringing him on knew how he worked and, I trusted his uh, directing abilities and his uh, uh, he's extremely talented. I, I also have told Almog this. I was like, oh, he's way out of my talent league. I don't know if he's going to want to <laughs> work with me on this. So when he was like, oh, I want to work with you. I was like, no way. This is great. I can't believe he wants to work on my <laughs> crazy. 
Um, so yeah, I think there needs to be oh, a little mutual respect, you know. So I felt Agreed. I feel very respected by Almog. I would hope he feels the same by me. So it's easy to communicate with someone when there's that level of respect. Well said, Almog. I'll ask you the same question. Ditto to all things that were said. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I mean, just like Jen said, I think there's there needs to be this like trust not to use the title of the film <laughs> nice. but like the, there need there just needs to be this trust any any performance uh, obviously at the end of the day like jen wrote the script right so it's like she has a very clear idea of what this film should be which sometimes can be you know sometimes with writers maybe that's more of a challenge because if the writer has such a specific idea and the the director comes in with something that doesn't that doesn't mesh with every every aspect that could be a challenge but jen i have to say is like very good at like here's the core like she she comes in with the script and the core and the concept and the characters and then she's extremely open to changes when they make sense for the film right so it's like every time i you know i came in with something that was maybe a little different than scripted and even in developing the script together it was just like jen has always been very open to ideas and i think that only comes with trust like me trusting you know her vision for the script and her trusting me in my directing and my vision for the script um so and you know that trust comes with like years of working together beforehand um so so i think it's just that openness and at the end of the day every every performance is a collaboration right yes. between a, an actor and a director uh both both artists come with ideas and in an ideal world. Well, actually, I wouldn't even say in an ideal world, they mesh perfectly. In an ideal world, they don't. And then there's a conversation about it. And then you arrive at the best idea, you know, that is a, um, a combination of both of those approaches, right? So I think having the ability to have those conversations openly comes with that trust. Well said. Um, so Jennifer, I'm gonna throw it back to you here. Um, so by by the time I upload this, uh, people will have seen it, heard my review. So I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a little spoilery. Um, was there any how do I put this? When you originally set to make to expand this short into a full film, was there a certain message that you wanted the audience to take away? Because full disclosure, once I got to the end of the movie, I I, I was like really sitting here thinking on it and like meditating on it. And I was like, you know, I feel like the message is that there is or one of the messages you could take away is that there's strength in being able to walk away and knowing what your worth is like family, family members or not, because <laughs> while I was watching the movie, I kept going, man, um, I completely agree with, I just kept agreeing with Kate just over and over. And I was like, is the movie trying to get me to, to not agree with her? But then I just kept watching. I was like, went, um, no, she's, she's right. Her family kind of sucks. And, 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 and by the time I got to the end with something that the dad does that made me flip my shit, I was like, wow, I, I hate him more now and i actually like her more like was there something that going into it you were like i i kind of want to land here yeah, or i feel like we live in this weird time where people want to categorize everything as good or bad and so one of the things i really wanted to show is like even in writing this feature i think i was judging some of the characters as being all good and all bad and i realized that people are really nuanced and some good people do bad things and bad people do good things. And I wanted to show, like, even with the dad, the family loves him. They don't really know about some of the details that his kids know. And so I wanted to show that dichotomy that um, some people are going to hate all of these characters, including mine. Some people will find little oh. glimmers in each of them. But at the end of the day, these people are not meant to be in the same room. And I think <laughs> from a young age, I've always been taught to make things work, whether it's family, relationships, friends. And like, I'm still to this day fighting that type of thing where people are like, well, can't you reconcile? Can't you have another conversation? Can't you? And I'm a big fan of now saying to people, 
that um, you can't have a conversation with people who are committed to misunderstanding you and that there's a power in removing yourself and walking away from uh, and being the villain in someone else's story. At the end of the day, like maybe Kate's the villain in uh, Trini's story or uh, I think in this environment, um, sometimes I, that's the message I was hoping that people would leave with that, like, at the end of the day, prioritize you that um, it's never too late to walk away from any relationship, family or otherwise, obviously, it's, it's circumstantial. And yeah. it is, but I, I see too many films and too many messages that promote reconciliation. And that's been personally harmful to me. So I wanted to see something that says like you're empowered and leaving. I it, it's funny. I was having this conversation um, about um, God, who was I talking to? I was talking to a friend, and we were talking about things that we maybe grew up watching and have gone back and watched and been like, Ugh. and I, I was I was talking about how I was watching a certain sitcom, um, and to your point. It, I feel like media pushes that, well, so what if they did this? Like, you still need to figure it out. And it's like, sometimes to your point, you need to just cut cut bait and go like, for my mental health, this, like, I can't be, you know, love someone from a distance uh, as, as, as the term goes. Um, and, I, and I really love, like, as Kate kind of goes through everything, um, there's this one particular moment at the funeral involving singing that I was just face at. And I, and I, can you talk to me about that scene? And was that something that was in the short? Because that, that uh, moment that was, in particular, just. That was inspired by my life. Um, and oh. I won't go too much detail, but, um, uh, forever ago there was a funeral and it was like a circus and um, my childhood best friend was there and someone got up and sang in the middle people were shouting across the funeral I went up to the rabbi at the end and apologized to that I was related to these freaks and apparently I don't remember this but I turned to my best friend and I went oh my gosh this literally is a movie like I'm so embarrassed and <laughs> I wanted to honestly we the actual reality of what happened was significantly worse but in when I showed Almog my initial script and a lot of other people they were like this is unbelievable and this is like crazy these characters are acting insane they feel like characters so we toned it down a lot so that you can still sense the humanity like it's obviously there are some extreme circumstances but these people feel real and that was important okay um, Alma, there, there's one shot I wanted to ask you about in particular, um, cause I love this shot. There's this, there's a shot where Josh is talking, uh, to Kate near the end of the movie and like Kate's by her car, like on the, uh, like the, on the sidewalk and Josh is like maybe four feet away from her and there's an, there's a tree in between them. Now, it, was that an intentional visual cue to go ahead and represent a, a literal divide between the two of them? Because if so, that's fucking brilliant. Because I like I saw that, <laughs> I was like, huh, okay, this feels intentional. Or was that like a happy accident? I, I... Everything is intentional. Just kidding. We did not plant the tree there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's interesting you say that because, I mean, the intention with that shot to be entirely honest with you, I don't think I ever noticed the tree. Now I'll go back and look at this tree. But the intention behind the shot, the intention you got from it was there. And like, it's very much like this, the two of them standing facing each other. And it's like split down the middle. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's supposed to be very much like he's still in that same scene you know where she's about to leave another thing that i talked to with stan our director of photography who is incredibly talented and i love working with him um we had this idea i think when we set up the shot for for uh heston who plays josh that if you look on his shot he's like framed by the house like yeah. he's almost like almost the the house as a cage which um damien talks about the dad earlier in the film it's like we wanted to have that idea play through in the framing of josh and the reason why josh ultimately like stays behind he's trying to keep the family together he's still like tethered to the house and the family 
whereas Kate's, you know, like we, she's facing more toward the street, like she's about to like leave and and free herself, right? So I think in that two shot you're talking about, like uh, Josh is on the side of the house, he's trapped with the house, and then Kate is on the side of the street, she's about to be free, and then we we also like had that theme play through in their coverage, each of their shots. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, I will ask you, uh, since you are the director, um, what was the hardest, what was the biggest challenge directing this film? Um, you know, what a great question. I think the, this was, I think the biggest cast of, not I think, it was, it was the biggest cast of a film that I've directed. Um, you know, part of it is because it's my first feature. So obviously you're going to have more characters in a feature film. But there were a lot of scenes with a lot of cast. Um, you know, there there was there's like the extended family. There's the funeral scene. So it's um, I think the biggest challenge, and actually like the most fun, really, once you get into it, even though it's a bit of a headache. You, it's juggling all these different characters and performances that like play with each other. Whether that's in the funeral, we had this very like long take it's a six and a half minute take in the funeral home uh, after the funeral yes and that was the most challenging to coordinate just logistically we had practically every actor that's in the movie in that shot and we had one day to get it we did not have a rehearsal day ahead of time so it was like half a day of rehearsing half a day of filming that was a very um intricate shot which was you know, it's funny, I, I found myself in prep, like I had figured out the shot list for like everything else. And I almost always put that shot like off because it was like, <laughs> oh my God, I don't even know where to start with this. So I kept like not thinking about it <laughs> until like Just two weeks off. before we shot. And then I was like, all right, I need to like start thinking about it because we can't just figure it out on the day. We have to figure it out beforehand and then make adjustments. So that was like the biggest uh, like mind hurdle, you know, but it was so like, once we got into it, it was so much fun, you know? Right. Yeah. I love the way that shot was shot. Cause it's almost like you feel the walls co- closing in on Kate, like the more that scene goes on. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Jennifer, to throw it back to you um, as a writer, one thing that I always find myself really kind of struggling with and kind of fighting myself on is like how, how I can visually represent the person that I'm writing for when it came to casting everyone like how hard was that as far as going like okay this is how I you know this is how I picture them on the on the script this is the the visual representation of them and knowing that you nailed that so um in terms of casting I was very actively involved I had um a lot of people trying to pressure me to change the three main cast um, because uh, obviously I cast myself and two people who were in the short and were relatively unknown. Um, So I was getting a lot of feedback to cast name actors in those roles. And I said, no, I I wrote those roles with them in mind. And I'm glad that I stuck to my guns. I think they did a phenomenal job. Um, And then in terms of the rest of the cast, I initially wrote Damien as I think even in the script, I said something like snot dripping down his face. He's like wiping his face, like as just absolute like disgust in human form. And then the feedback I got was like, that's a little bit on the nose. What if he's charming and likable and like a good looking dude? And, and so stuff like that, I was open to that feedback. And I think Lyndon crushed it. It makes sense to go in that direction. Um, One of the aunts I I knew from doing theater forever ago. So I insisted on casting her. Um, So I I had certain people in mind for certain roles. And then beyond those set people, we sort of sat down, Almog and I, with the casting director and came up with some lists as to like dream actors for each role that we could reach out to. And then um, our casting person would throw in some random people that we wouldn't have even thought that are totally off type. And sometimes they were the best choice for the role. Other times I stuck to my guns, but um, I knew with the five main family, I wanted it to feel um, suffocating and chaotic. <laughs> and I think we nailed it on that front. 
Uh, agreed. Um, so, so actually, to throw it back on that, was there any hesitation to cast yourself? Like, you know, I am my own worst critic, and I think, um, I, I think I probably put a little too much on my plate in terms of like we would yell cut, all mom would yell cut, and I'm signing a check, making a phone call, so it's hard to go like <laughs> from actor to producer to uh, like it's it's a lot to take on. Um, but no, actually in the past, it's funny. I was talking to my mom about this day, how I had an ex who used to be like, you need to stop writing things for yourself, like write good stories. And on our festival circuit, everyone has been like, it's so smart that you've been writing things for yourself. And that's sort yeah. of the reason I segued into writing is I come from an acting background. It's hard to get your foot in the door. And, um, no, I, I was insistent on putting myself in this and, I'm glad I did, even though I have trouble watching the screenings now because of me. <laughs> oh, do you? You're you're one of those. You it's can't. the one scene. <laughs> no. yeah, I, I like, it's like funny that. every time we every time we screen the film, and I don't yeah. know why, because I think it's a great scene, and I think Jen crushed it. But because she's, I guess, her own worst critic, every time the scene comes on, <laughs> she has to go to the bathroom. Like, no, you don't. I know what you're doing because you have to go to the bathroom at every you know the same spot every time we screen the movie <laughs> wait what, so what what's what scene is that the what? shower scene although now i just like sit in the lobby during the screenings because i'm i'm like i'm too involved i don't even know if this film is in english anymore I've, <laughs> I, I, don't know I can't um but I am Whereas, i'm the complete i'm the complete opposite like i love watching it in a theater full of i like you know i also edited the film so i've seen it literally more than anyone but i when you're editing it and you're in the room by yourself, you have no idea how to feel about anything anymore. And when you're, yeah. and when you're in a room and people are laughing when they're supposed to, you you hear crying when they're supposed to. You're like, okay, this like this works. It's a like affirming, but b it's a cool way to experience it as a viewer, just as a member of the audience. Like it's nice yeah. to like sit back and not be. Well, I, you know, trying not to be too critical, but just enjoy the film as a as a viewer. And that can only happen with an audience. So every time we screen into an audience, like I'm there, I love it. I'm I'm right there with you. Like I hate like editing my podcast is my least favorite thing because I have to hear <laughs> my voice. And it's just like, oh God, like I I I I hate it so much. It makes me cringe whenever I do it. So I I completely understand. Um Jennifer, um writing wise was there anything that was left on the cutting room floor that you really wanted to kind of get in the movie and like weren't able to or um no not really um I think there were certain things in the funeral that I initially was a little bummed about removing um certain things that emulated the actual funeral that inspired the funeral scene but um I'm big on telling the best story and I think that that was the biggest challenge for me is like what aspects of my lived experience am I married to versus telling the best story and at a certain point I just think telling the best story is mo most important and um I yeah I don't think there was anything that needed to be included that wasn't already included um Al Mog, I'll, I'll ask I'll ask you um considering your background and everything and this being your your first feature um I know you talked about some of the the challenges like was there a moment um directing this that you kind of went oh now I got it because like I, I would feel like you guys get into a rhythm at a certain point you go okay now we're now we're cooking like was there a certain moment where you went okay like I got this or um what a great question i think i think it was like three quarters into day one <laughs> um specific okay <laughs> yeah like because you know day one day one's always like one big question mark like you can prep all you want and then when you're there to film on the first day it's like it's like okay cool we're doing this like what we are filming right now will be in the film and the performances we're capturing that's like sets the tone for the rest and and also it's like the first time that the cast and the crew are working together right everyone working together so it's kind of this this it's this train that you hope will be moving at a good pace and then it's always a little slow you know the beginning of every day is 
a little slower than you'd like, but day one is always like everyone's getting in the groove. And I think, I think like a couple hours into day one, I was like probably internally freaking out a little bit. I was like, we should be <laughs> at this, you know, we should be here by now, but we're here. And like, is this going to work? And like, you know, you have this idea in your mind. You're like, we're not capturing exactly my idea, whatever. But yeah. then once everyone gets in the groove, um, it's, it's, great and then you know by day two like it's like cool we we did a day now we just like <laughs> emulate that obviously every day is very different but it's like we were able to do it once now we just need to repeat it 17 more times <laughs> so yeah how long did you guys shoot we had 18 shoot days okay. uh, over three and a half weeks so it was three weeks with obviously weekends off and then a four half of a fourth week okay nice yeah uh um, Jennifer, I've got kind of a complicated one for you. So what is what was the hardest scene to shoot as an actor? And what was the hardest scene as the writer? Um, yeah. Um, as an actor, I think day one was hard just to get in the rhythm of things. And also, um, Almog likes to do a lot of takes. And... <laughs> And yeah, it, I do. Yeah, it's great, <laughs> it gives you room to play. But at first, my my first thought after you know the first few takes was, oh, it's because I suck and I am terrible. Why did I put myself in this? Um, but then you know after after a few days, I was like, oh, that's he just does a lot of takes. It's not because I'm the worst in the world. Um, so <laughs> got over that. But then I would say the wa running into the ocean was a challenge because um, one, I'm afraid of the ocean. Um, and it was freezing and, and you have to really be in the moment and turn it on and like get to this emotional climax. Um, that was challenging. Um, and then from a writing perspective, I'd say the 10. I know exactly which one. Oh, the never one mind. Oh, <laughs> no. oh, I'm curious what you were going to say. Yeah, I, actually, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. What you, what you got? The, well, the one -er for me, like I wrote it as a one -er, um, but it obviously is a challenge to have all the crew hit their marks all the actors hit their marks and I think we did 17 takes of that scene oh, and I was just like gosh I really hope this works like um there were a couple times where like one person would miss a mark and then you'd have to reset so it was definitely a challenge but in my mind I was like there's no other way to do to feel the chaos of being at a funeral when like you know, you're there to honor this person, but then someone's talking about a game that's on TV. Someone else is talking about, like, there's so much going on and it feels like overwhelming and suffocating. And I didn't think it was possible to do it without that winner. But Almog, I'd love to know what you thought I was going to say. Well, I would thought you were going to say the the first family scene. I mean, that was also in the back of my head. Because I feel like, you know, that, that was, uh, according to Jen, uh, her favorite written scene her favorite scene in the script that she wrote really and then when okay and then when we were you know it's like that first scene when the extended family is in it's kind of that chaotic everyone's trying to be helpful and coordinate where to go to lunch and that whole thing um so that was jen's favorite written scene and when we were filming it it was actually the first day that the the extent the actors of the extended family arrived so it was just like a lot more bodies in the room a lot more back and forth and I and I think we all felt it that it was not exactly the version that we had imagined. It felt like, you know, even I think I think that they took a a, a toll. It was emotionally drain, draining for everyone. And I can see a little bit on Jen's face because she's, you know, it kind of worked for the scene because Kate needed to be emotionally drained. <laughs> but <laughs> I can, you know, I think everyone on set felt a little bit of this like, oh, this scene is a lot. And then it worked for the film. And Jen is, you know, we're both very happy with how it came out, like in the edit. But I think on the day, it was definitely emotionally draining. And we were all kind of wondering, will this scene work? Like, you know, when we in post, will it come out the way we we hoped it would? Is there, um, Jennifer, I, 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 I'll ask you first, was there a scene? So I think one thing I love about how you acted, by the way, I think you killed it in that department, oh, um, especially so many of your visual uh, expressions tell a story like my favorite, like, like once the singing happens at the funeral, 
Uh, I think it's like the 20, 20 minute, 37 second mark, I believe. Um, you have this look on your Very face. Very specific. Um, I, I, take a, <laughs> I take a lot of notes. Man. <laughs> but, but I, uh, That's great. But you have this look on your face like you could, like if you had laser eyes, you would zap everyone there. And I remember I had to pause because I was laughing really hard. But like that level of irritation of being able to convey that in just a visual cue is something I really, like I was very impressed by. And I think- and I think that at several points, whether it's that, whether it's you go and get your wine and rosin, that's not there. I think so many of your expressions tell almost like these little mini stories within the film. Um, kind of talk to me about that. Like that's a that was like a conscious decision because I think by the end of the movie where Kate ends up, you almost see her just kind of like almost exhale because I feel like you're like. Kate's like a ticking clock throughout the whole film and she has these like little moments where she almost gets a little bit out but then she has to kind of go back into like camo mode almost to try and just function so yeah kind of talk to me like about about that yeah I think so much of acting is what's unsaid um and it's I, I think a lot of actors when you take a script you're like so focused on the dialogue and I think that the most important beats are when you're listening and reacting to people. I think I also naturally have reactions when I don't think I'm reacting in my own life. Like all will be like, Jennifer, <laughs> you look disgusted. And I'm like, no, I don't. And then I'm looking at myself. I'm like, oh my God, I like can't. Hide. I will never say Jennifer. <laughs> but you know, I, I, like, I, I think that for, for Kate, there's a lot of like, it's it's like these subtle reactions of uh where you know you just see a glimmer in her eye of like I can't believe these people um until she finally realizes to prioritize herself and it that's when there's the sigh of relief but um I, it almost feels like you know she gets home and she thought she could trust her brother then she realizes that he's not on her team necessarily he's trying to amend everything so I think there's a lot that she wants to say but doesn't feel like she can say it to anyone. And she, she, you, if you're paying attention, you could see that on her face. And, and there's a lot that's like unsaid through her expressions. And um, if a family member were to, like even just talking to Aunt Paula when Aunt Paula's like, we have each other. And Kate's like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like she doesn't even need to say it. You can tell that she does not agree, but I don't think she feels safe to say what's on her mind. So she says it with her face. Um, you have one scene and, and I, and I think from a writing perspective, it's maybe my favorite scene. Um, it's where Josh goes off on, um, on a uh, Mark and I, and I'll, and I, I won't give anything more than that, but that scene in particular, I was like, Whoa, like it just, it felt like what, like I actually remember actually rewound the scene. Cause I think that, um, uh, I just love that scene so much. Talk to me about writing that scene in particular, because that feels like one of the more emotionally charged moments in the film. Um, so Almog, I'll ask you in a second about directing that, but Jennifer, from a writing perspective, had like talk to me about that scene. Yeah, so that was actually a later addition into the script, but um, I, I've i lost um, family to suicide, and I've seen a lot of films that kind of haphazardly throw a suicide into like even on TV all the time I'm seeing content where it's just like a little bit in a script and I wanted to show the impact of this on Josh and how people are not necessarily cognizant of the way in which this affects a person like even in my own life I remember when I lost someone to suicide my mom called the head of my high school and at the end of the week, the head of my high school made some comment to my mom about like, oh, well, Jennifer's not doing well. She's not over it yet. Like, why isn't she over it yet? Or so, uh, something, uh, else, which is just so insulting and shocking. But there is this yeah. expectation of like, oh, I'm sorry that this happened. But the next day, like uh, life keeps going on and you're expected to heal. And so I wanted to show I wanted to show that. I also wanted to show we don't really know the mom other than what we hear through the family we know she helped create this business and it's this weird dichotomy where like we we kind of make it apparent that she was struggling enough to not be doing her job well 
Um, but at the same time, it's for, for a child of someone who's struggling, it's like, how do you vouch for this person? And, um, I thought it was important to put that in there to help destigmatize any sort of mental health issues and show how much of an effect this has on the family. So to piggyback off of that, um, I think you make a insanely bold decision as far as what caused that. Um, like, like, like I said, people, you should have listened to the review by now. So I will just kind of spoil and say that it was an affair, an affair. I won't get into the very ickness behind it, but <laughs> that decision in particular, I thought was incredibly brave and, and, and pretty shocking, honestly, because it's like, oh, an affair, that's not great. And then it's like, oh, fuck, that's much worse than I pictured because, you know, Damien is vile for that. Um, kind of talk to me about that decision from a writing perspective. Was that in the the short or no? It wasn't in the short. Um, in the feature, it was, uh, and this is not in any of the script. But Almog and I talked about sort of the backstory of all this, and we created this whole backstory that mom was going through her mental health struggles and probably put, like how Damien would justify this decision is. Damien probably was trying to help mom. Mom was pushing him away. Um, like the impact of her mental health struggles on the family. And he acted out by doing this awful thing. I mean, that's sort of the backstory we talked to Lyndon about to try and make him uh, come at this character with less judgment so that there's some glimmer of hope at the same time. Um, I I kind of wanted to show Amber being a victim of the father just sort of the domino effect of the actions and how um, it can sort of degrade an entire room of people, how one person's actions can affect um, multiple people and how maybe mom, we, we don't really delve into it, but maybe mom wasn't getting the help that she necessarily needed. Um, and now Damien has to live with the regret of his choices or, and I think he's also now at a point where he's trying to, maybe make himself the victim of a situation that he's not the victim of. Um, so there's a lot of different layers to it. And I, I wanted to sort of delve into that. And I think for their marriage, the final straw was that affair. Um, I, I want to say, I, I, I want to shout you out again from a writing perspective, because I was going back and forth with that in my head. Cause I'm like, Oh, what they did was so messed up. But then again, they were like a kid, but also like, this is your friend. How can you like, I, I, and I was, I kept going in the circle thinking about it. And I, and I was actually almost mad at you. Cause I'm like, why are you making me think about this? So much? But I was like, but, but that was the goal. I wanted, I wanted to, you know, I think that's the thing is like my character hated her friend for a long time. And I think that part of the film is like forgiving, but also keeping the door closed. That, yes. That's a big message I wanted to leave people is like, I, I also hear all the time, like, forgive and forget. And I am a big fan of forgiving yourself for tolerating certain things. And like, I I don't think people deserve forgiveness unless they've earned it. I think you well can said. forgive yourself for tolerating certain behaviors and disrespect. But unless there's a genuine apology, I don't think it's warranted. And I think even when there is, in the case of Amber, it's okay to forgive and also be like, I forgive you. I understand how difficult this situation was and um, move on and don't bring me in your life. I think that's an important message. I love that you did that from the perspective of um, uh, Kate just telling Josh, like, you know, it's okay for you. Like, I love that that's one of the last things that she says to him. I was like, cause, cause writing wise, I really was kind of sitting here going, okay, that's that's pretty unforgivable. I really hope Kate doesn't just walk this back. And when she didn't, I was like, oh, extra brownie point. Thank you so much for not doing that. Because I think lesser writers would walk that back. And so I, all the credit in the world for you for sticking by that, because that made me like the film more. Um, yeah. Almog, I am going to ask you, uh, I've got a couple more questions here. Filming mm -hmm. that scene in um, in Kate's friend's room, I think that's one of the best. Uh, I think that's one of the best shot films in the whole uh, in the whole movie. And I love that Kate gets that moment to 
finish what she was saying at the funeral before she was uh, rudely <laughs> interrupted. Uh, kind of talk to me about that. But then also I wanted to ask you about how um, the opening sequence where uh, Kate's walking to her classes and she gets that initial phone call in the way that you guys play with the sound. Um, is that supposed to um, represent Kate like having a panic attack? Because that happens like four or five times throughout the film. So kind of talk to me about that initial bedroom scene and then kind of about the uh, that other sequences there, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so I mean, at the beginning, the very first scene, uh, that was something that Jen and I talked a lot about and just the script stage is we both felt it was important to have to see what Kate's life is like before the call right before before she finds out that her, her mom died because then she's kind of sucked back into the family right something she's been avoiding for a while and now she's sucked back into it she has no choice so having that scene where she, she's doing well she's in school she's like she's you know a go-getter kind of on the up and up um and then when she gets the call it was very much we sh we shot it both ways but i kind of knew the it, it you know in the edit it's like she gets the call and then we linger like in the on the back of her head um and we don't see her expression um at, you know and that was a very conscious decision because easily we could have you know been on her face and see her start to get this like panic attack and and cut from there but i found it it's more interesting to you know have us imagine it but then also to kind of build up to the big like panic attack that kind of comes later on like we don't want to see it now but we can allude to it and assume how she might react to getting such a call but we don't see it quite yet so um so that scene was very important to kind of set the that stage but i very consciously wanted to like linger on the back of her head so we don't fully see how she's reacting to it because it, there's also a lot going on there right it's like maybe this is a call she was fearing that might come for a while um so because because there's all these emotions in there i almost wanted to just see the back of her head and then we unfold all this emotional journey with the as you know as the film progresses yeah i really thought like kind of I, I thought that was a great decision not showing the the ramifications immediately of the panic attack and kind of just giving you little almost like bite-sized glimpses in kate's psyche as the film went on i think from a directorial perspective and a writing perspective that was incredibly well handled a um, couple more questions for y'all. Um, Jennifer, I'll start with you, uh, with Trini. Um, she, <laughs> uh, as a character, I was, I, I, oh my God, she was so infuriating to me. But, but there were, there were these, there's like one or two moments where I was like, oh, I feel a, a tinge, like a twinge of sympathy for her. Like, not a ton, because I think she's terrible. <laughs> But but I felt a little sympathy for her. Talk was she the hardest character for you to write um, for this film? Or definitely, we really toned her down quite a bit because um, we we wanted to uh, have characters that had humanity, that had moments of hopefulness and glimmers of hope. And I think I initially wrote her pretty one dimensionally, and so we had to sort of build in the layers to her and I think she does have some redeemable moments and it makes it so the audience does sympathize with her at times so that was important to show because also just in life I, I think I mentioned this before but I think people are layered and not all good or all bad and I wanted to show how sometimes you have the perfect concoction of people who shouldn't be in the same room <laughs> yes. and I think that uh, is reflected here that maybe in a different environment she wouldn't be acting this way I think in certain isolated moments we see her humanity shine through um, so so I wanted the audience to feel conflicted about her in those moments okay I think um, piggybacking off of that like yeah, I think based off the conversations you know that Jen and I had about really maybe 
uh, pulling it back with Trini to to make her with both Trini and Damien to make him a little more um, just so we can sympathize or empathize with them a little more because then they like they are people even though they are wrong 95 percent of the time (laughs) we want to we want to like feel that they're real people but also more from like a structure like plot structure um um, perspective you know that was something that was very important to me and in conversations with jen like having that scene between the sisters where there's where they connect and you think huh maybe this family will make it work. And a part of you is not sure how to feel about it because you're like, they shouldn't, but maybe that'll be nice, but maybe not. So it's like to to have that empathy and that humanity makes you believe there will be some sort of resolution for this family. Um, and then to like take that away at the end, you know? So that <laughs> yeah. was like, it was important to, it was important for us to like build that arc of like, okay, maybe this will be um, that type of film where they make it all work by the end. So it's important to build that possibility so that it's satisfying when it's not the ending. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, I will ask you, speaking of the ending, was there ever a point where the ending was different? Like, did you write the ending first and then you wrote backwards? Or like, how did you kind of attack the script? That's actually one of the two things that I said. So no love story and the ending was always going to be that. Um, I okay. had people who pressured me otherwise. Um, we even had someone at a, at a festival who was upset by the ending, but I appreciated that reaction because yeah, I think that, um, you know, I want people to leave thinking and uh you know considering the ending and i know for some people it it's upsetting that the family isn't making it work that she's not trying to make it work but for me i thought that was the only hopeful ending that that staying in it i mean even just i reflecting on the messages i could have used in my past i'm like man if i had had messages that said you can leave you should leave you don't need to try and make this work i think i would have been out of some unhealthy situations for myself a lot sooner so that's kind of Mm. I wanted to leave people with that message and some people might not love that um, but I think it's important especially when so much media pushes reconciliation I don't think that's healthy I'm I'm a big fan of uh, knowing when it's your time to walk away I personally love the ending it's actually the most hopeful ending I think this film could have so hearing that people like I, I I find that kind of baffling to be honest like because I love the fact that as Kate is driving away that's the first unironic like laugh or smile she's had all film and I was like oh okay like 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 good this is this is great um last question I have for both of y'all um just because I found it creatively interesting um was there um the really the closest look we get of the mom is really the um when Kate is watching like the video the home videos with her and they're going through her um her old photos and all that was was it a conscious decision early on to not do any flashbacks or anything like that with the mom like it was that was that as close as you wanted to get to a flashback like yeah, so for me, and actually my actual mom was the mom whose photos we used. And oh, dad, I love that. Yeah, my dad was an extra, so he was like, this is so weird to be <laughs> seeing my wife, you know, at a funeral. Not not the best vibes here. Um, <laughs> but for me, it wasn't her story. It was the story of how the, the how, like, I think how much love her, her family had for her and the the impact of this death on the family was more the focus and like I think even for Kate she feels guilty that eventually like I it's implied that mom wasn't doing so well but she went and left and went to college so I think there's guilt in that choice but I I I felt like the story was more about Kate's character and her grieving process and how she can hold space to love and mourn her mom, even though she's so mad at her mom for making this decision. Um, So I wanted to really focus on the impact of the death versus like 
the mom's lived experience, if that makes sense. That does. No, that that really does. Uh, Almog, uh, I'm going to throw it back to you here. Uh, filming that scene in particular, um, I would say, oh, it's probably that scene. That's one of the most emotionally charged scenes in the film. And I feel like that's kind of almost like the powder keg moment where everything just kind of boils over. Talk to me about filming that tension. I think you do a great job of just kind of ramping it up like a little bit as each person has their dialogue. Kind of talk to me about uh, directing that scene. And the scene we're talking about is the home video scene, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was very obviously pivotal scene. It's like a turning point. There's secrets revealed and and uh it's a big moment for these three siblings. It was a very um it was a very fun, challenging film to shoot, especially because we were confined to like that one room. Um <laughs> but it was really it was really fun figuring it out again as jen mentioned i like to take takes not for the sake of taking takes um but because i think we're figuring it out obviously there's you do a lot of it in rehearsal and that's great and that's important but then on the day there's there's still an element of figuring it out and i think for that scene specifically there was a lot of that figuring it out like as we were filming with every take it became a little clear what the intention is like with every line and i think a, a lot of things that were like that i i loved playing with was the the secrecy right so there's like between josh and trini and what trini was doing with the ashes and <clears throat> the fact that josh knew about it and these kind of looks they're giving each other to like great not reveal, here, not by, now. Great reveal, by the way. That that oh, that made me so mad. But <laughs> <laughs> so it was very much like, you know, that scene is like you don't realize what everything has been leading to until the scene, until things are revealed. Um, so there was that that um, uh, powder keg moment. But then another emotional crux of that scene for me was like because it's really the first time we see um you know we see mom in a uh you know not in a photo but in a in a home video in a memory she is she is alive in this moment on tv right so it's like a very emotional moment because we as the audience all we know of her is this photo right from the funeral and now we get a glimpse into everything these kids remember and it's like oh now we understand all the emotionality that went into every scene up to this point like when we maybe understand Trini a little more we understand Kate a little more we understand Josh a little more so it was just an important moment as an emotional kind of climax and and obviously that scene leads to Kate's big emotional climax so it was a very important moment from all these different like respects yeah, which I think you both nail from all your perspectives. Um, last question I have for both of you. Um, Almag, I'll start with you. What is the biggest takeaway from this whole experience of directing this film? What is your biggest takeaway? What's your biggest lesson learned, if you want to phrase it like that, that you're going to take from this film onto your next project? Um, Another good question. I think two things. One is like work with people who you trust and ideally know personally but if you don't know then um someone can vouch for the person you know that you're working with whether it's cast or crew um because again like i said it's very important to have that that trust in each other um and then the other you know it's a little maybe like simple to say but uh, because it was my first feature film there's always a, that little tiny bit of like anxiety going into it. it's like this is a feature this is the long game this is a marathon it's not like a four-day short film shoot it's like an 18-day feature film and now that i have done it it's like i know it's possible so what feels maybe like this impossible task if you split it into you know little task like each day is its own little bubble and within each day every scene is it's it's like if you break down a feature into you know little pods <laughs> then it's possible and when i 
I was able to start thinking of it in that way. And it just made this like intangible thing of a feature film a lot more um, possible. So that was like my biggest takeaway. It's like now I can go into my next not, next feature film knowing like how to approach it. Okay. I, I love that answer. Uh, Jennifer, what about you? Um, I would say showing gratitude and uh, respecting everyone at every stage of the process from you know, the biggest actor on set to the PAs, like we could not have made this film without every hand on deck. And um, I on our set, there was, everyone seemed very respectful. And um, I've been on other sets where I can see the uh, hierarchy at play. Mm. And I'm a big fan of, you know, the people who work well together, bring them along on the journey to the next project and um, coming up together. So uh, you just never know who on a set is going to be doing something else uh, later on. And I like to uh, create a safe, happy working environment. So uh, continuing to do that and um, uh, echoing all mock sentiments, uh, working with people you know and like and um, having contracts always in play because I think <laughs> contracts maintain friendships. <laughs> Well said. Um, Almog, Jennifer, thank you so much for taking part of your day to talk with me. This was horribly enjoyable, and I, I really enjoyed talking to both of you. Thank you so much. Um, last thing I will ask you all before you get out of here, Jennifer, um, if you please share your uh, where p the, uh, people can find you on social media if you have it, and then uh, what projects do you have coming up? Yeah, you can find me on most socials at jenhearts247. I think I'm the Jennifer Levinson on TikTok. And then <laughs> um, working on a bunch of different projects right now. Um, Almog and I are developing a horror feature called Age. I have my Ooh. own script, How to Hunt a Narcissist. And then um, a bunch of other projects, one called Cut Purse and um, developing another horror about... Um, abandoned malls so very excited for all of the uh, upcoming horror based projects nice let's go we also uh, have another feature we're collaborating on called tagged oh yeah is... we do oh my god I, I literally <laughs> there's so can't... many projects that we can't even keep track um but yeah the, the two of us are collaborating with a third writer and it's based on a we recently made a short film for halloween just like a horror film so it's like a feature version of that okay that we also have in the works and then, yeah, I have, um, I also have a couple other features I'm working on. Um, and hopefully, you know, one or all of them will happen in the next year. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, any, uh, any, uh, any socials they can find you on all my, oh yeah, I'm, uh, you know, also on most of the socials, um, at allmog.aa. Perfect. And then um, when should this be out for people to uh, to uh, to uh, to check out? It's out. <laughs> so it just came out two days ago. So it's available on Amazon, iTunes, Google Play. I think YouTube TV. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everywhere you you rent or buy movies, it is available. Perfect. And I will definitely be tagging you both once the. Uh, interview and the review are, are are live i uh i already did my review this morning a uh, spoiler it's a it's a very good rating so uh yes. so <laughs> so, uh, so i will share y'all on that but um Love jennifer i'll mock seriously um i enjoyed this film so much i can't wait to see y'all's next collaboration it's a it's a day one watch for me like i can't wait to see what y'all do next um again thank you so much for taking the time i really appreciate it and uh i hope you guys have a good rest of your day thank you thank you, you. thank you so much for having us this was so this was a blast yeah thank you again for taking the time you guys take care you too all right bye, bye. <laughs>